Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we've been turning to pretty much the whole men's class all year. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Just give me a moment to turn there. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. The Bible says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. The title for the sermon tonight is Apt to Teach. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. So you see, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, 1 Timothy, Timothy was a younger pastor. Paul is telling, hey, you've got to be apt to teach. These are one of the qualifications. As you look men, as you look for men that you want to ordain as pastors, they have to have an aptitude to teach. And then later on, as we, we were going through on Wednesday, you know, 2 Timothy takes place a few years later. Again, he tells Timothy, you've got to be apt to teach. You have to have the aptitude to teach. And as I was going through the previous session, these things that we have laid out for us are good character, good behavior traits that we should be striving to achieve in our lives, okay? If you're someone that cannot teach, you're someone that is, is just, you know, you've never taught before. You don't know if you're able to convey or communicate very well. Well, this is an area that you can work on, right? This is an area you can develop in. But, you know, as a leader, especially as someone that comes and stands behind the pulpit, you may not be a leader by office. You may not necessarily be a leader just in practical uh, uh, running of the church. But when you get behind the pulpit, at that point in time, you are now taking on a leadership position. You're taking on a position of teaching. You're opening the Word of God, and everyone is ready to hear what you have to say, what you have prepared. And so it's important that you are, have the ability to teach that you are apt to teach. When it comes to this uh, characteristic that we need to develop, I've got 10 points that I want to cover with you today. 10 points. So I'm going to get you to, it's it's much more of a Bible study tonight. So uh, I'll get you to turn your Bibles to Exodus 24, please. Exodus 24, verse 12. Exodus 24, verse 12. Point number one is straightforward, but it's important, okay? So I've got 10 points as to how you can be a great teacher of the Word of God. The first point that I have is, number one, is to teach the Word of God, right? Point number one, straightforward, common sense, logical, teach the Word of God. But look at Exodus 24, verse 12. Exodus 24, verse 12. It says here, And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Okay? That thou mayest teach them. It does, God didn't say, teach quotes from pastors. He didn't say, teach poems. He didn't say, teach, you know, open up the hymn books and start teaching from the hymns. He didn't start, uh, say, you know, start teaching from some historical illustration. He said, no, teach them. Teach the tables of stone, the law, the commandments, which I have written. And so we take this application today as pastors, as preachers, as teachers, and say, well, I'm going to teach from the Word of God. When you stand behind this pulpit, that's what I want you to do. I don't care about anything else. You focus on the Word of God. That's what God has commanded Moses. That's what He's commanding us. But I want you to notice something else. God has given Moses all of these commandments and laws. He doesn't say, state them to the, to the church, right? Or to the congregation. He doesn't say, just show them and state them. He says, teach them. Teach them, okay? It's one thing for you to t- uh, say, you know, I believe X doctrine. It's another thing for you to teach X doctrine, Okay, And that's what you need to learn. It's not just this is what the Bible says. You have to teach. Why does it say that? What does it mean? How does that apply to me? You need to learn how to be a teacher. Go to Exodus 4 verse 10, please. Exodus 4 verse 10. Moses did not think he would be a good teacher. He did not think he would be a good leader. In Exodus 4 verse 10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither he, heretofore, neither since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. 
And brethren, I feel like I'm that person. I don't think I'm eloquent. I, I have very simple language, right? I grew up by parents. English was their second language, right? So I didn't really get the best English out of my parents. I, I, I went to school in Canley Vale, which uh, a lot of Asian immigration in that period, uh, in that place, in Cabramatta. So a lot of my friends were immigrants. Again, English is not their first language. So I, I sometimes struggle. You'll see this as I preach. I'm trying to find just a very simple word, and it's just stuck in my brain. I, I can't get it off the tip of my tongue. Eventually, it comes out, or I have to rephrase it some other way. I'm not eloquent with my speech. And so I, I can kind of relate to what, what Moses is saying here. But then look at verse number 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made, uh, sorry, who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb or deaf or the seen or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. You say, Pastor Kevin, when I get behind the pulpit, what should I say? What God put in your mouth. Okay, what God has taught you. How did he teach me? When you read the Bible, right? When you prepared, when you got ready, that's God putting his words into your mouth. Okay? So please take the opportunity when you preach. If you say, I'm going to preach 40 minutes, I'm going to preach for an hour, I want to hear what God is saying through your mouth. Your personality is there, right? Your personality, God is using you to convey the message that God has given us. Point number one is teach the word of God. Point number two, if you guys can please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. Let's read it first before I give you the second point. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 4. Paul writes, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The second point that I have for you here is teach in the power of God. You see, when I get behind this pulpit, I, I don't preach, I don't speak the way that I would speak to you day by day. You know, if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, just you and I speaking about different things. Before I get up to preach, I'm always asking the Lord, please, Lord, give me your strength Give me your power. Please help me to be able to project properly. Help me to communicate properly because these are your people and I have weaknesses, Lord. Please just give me your power. Give me your spirit. Give me your strength. You need to have that to be an effective teacher to the church. Please never become so prideful where you just get, oh, yeah, it's my turn behind the pulpit. Oh, man, everyone loves me. I'm the best preacher. You know, you may think you're the best, but you, the hearers will hear the Spirit of God or the wisdom of man, okay? And Paul is very clear, no, I'm not using the wisdom of man here. When I teach, when I preach, I'm using the Spirit of God, I'm using the power of God. And this is, this is so important, and you know, I, the times I, I see this most in my life are those times when, I have, when I'm very limited, when I have very limited time to prepare, the few times that my plane's been delayed in Sydney or whatever, I'm coming back, I'm like, oh man, I've got to get back, I've got, I've got to preach a sermon tonight, you know, on Wednesday night. And there's been times, not very often, but there's been times when I've just only had an hour to prepare. Like, honestly, an hour, I, oh man, I, I, you know, I, I get dressed first, I'm ready to go, and then I'm like, okay, I've got an hour, and I'm thinking, oh man, this is going to be the worst sermon ever. You know, I, I'm, just, I'm just rushing through, you know, getting things ready. And then I preached, and it, it surprises me how many times I've preached those sermons and I'm like, I'm praying to God all the way. Like, God, please just, just help me. Help me preach, right? <laughs> I'm so, uh, I, feel, I feel bad, you know, people traveling to church and they're hearing me just prepare for an hour. Now, look, that's not what you should be doing on a regular basis. Like, oh, I'm only going to prepare for an hour. I'm going to just do 10 minutes. Because when you're doing that constantly, it's going to be shallow preaching. Everyone's going to realize, man, this guy's not prepared, you know? Uh, but what I found was when, when it's not my fault and I'm forced to have that hour to prepare and I've preached, that's where I get most people saying to me, that was a great sermon, right? That was really, you know, I really learned something. I'm like, well, what in the world? How did that happen? You know why? Because I preached in the power of God. I preached in His Spirit. And of course, if I'm not prepared, if I don't have knowledge, if I don't have wisdom, I'm not going to be able to do that. Of course, you know, preparing to teach, of course, you're using your lifelong lessons. You're using the things that you've learned. You know, you're begging God, please bring things back to my remembrance. The power of God is what's going to help you 
preach powerful sermons, things that change people's lives or just bring on new knowledge, things like that. You know, 2 Corinthians 12.10 says, For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, and for when I am weak, then am I strong. I love those words. I always, feel, I must, like, I almost feel weak all the time. I'm like, I'm in a failure of a man, God. Like, I'm such a bad preacher, Lord. I, and I listen to my sermons, and I'm listening. No, I said the wrong thing. <laughs> I said, I didn't mean to say, um, you know, uh, Jacob's father was trying to kill him. I meant Jacob's brother was trying to kill him. Why did I say that in my previous sermon? And I, I'm always like, oh, well, anyway, Lord, I guess you can use me in my weakness. And you know, I thank God that He's able to do that. But point number two was teach in the power of God. Please seek God's power, His Spirit before you come up to preach. The third point that I have here, and you can go back to 1 Timothy chapter 3 if you want, 1 Timothy chapter 3, is teach your family. Teach your family. Please, I, I don't want you to be just a guy that gets here and preaches to the church and just teaches the church. I really want you to make sure you're teaching your family as well, your, your, your wife, your children, right? Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9 says, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and to thy sons' sons. Teach your family. You guys are in 1 Timothy 3, look at verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Your family is the primary training ground for you to be an effective teacher in the church. Okay, that's the primary training ground. Yes, I'm giving you the opportunities to come here, preach so we can be blessed, preach so you can gain experience, so you can gain knowledge, you can gain the experience of putting sermons together. That's great. You know, I'm, I'm going to continue giving you those opportunities. But if you want to be most effective, use your time most wisely and it's going to have the greatest effect to the people that you love the most, preach to your family, men. Preach to your family. I'm not saying hour-long sermons. I'm just saying open up the Bible to your kids, to your wife. Let's read a chapter, you know, and, and let's understand this. Let's, let's understand this as a family. Kids, what do you take out of this? This is what the Bible is saying. Please don't lose that opportunity, especially if you're desiring to be a pastor, a deacon. You know, if a man knows not how to rule his own house, that has multiple means. What does it mean to rule, to be in charge, to be a lead, to be the head? Part of that is training your family, teaching your family. That's where God wants you to get the most experience so you can become an effective leader in the church. This is why men that do not meet the qualifications, divorce, remarried, one child, no children, they're always failures. They always get into heresies. They always fail somehow because they, they haven't got the training ground. Like they, they, they didn't learn how to do things effectively. They didn't learn you know, how to be manly. They didn't learn how to be a leader at home. And then they failed to be a leader in the church. That's point number three, teach your family. Point number four is teach what is right and wrong. Please go to Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 8. Teach what is right and wrong and wrong okay right and wrong and, and as i'm going through this i realize i might need to work a little bit more in this as well as, as a teacher that gets behind this pulpit you know it, it's it's I, th I think it's easier to teach what is right than to teach what is wrong but they they both need to be taught together leviticus chapter 10 verse 8 and the lord spake unto aaron saying do not drink wine nor strong drink thou nor thy sons with thee when thou go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And that ye may put difference between holy and unholy, and between unclean and clean. And that ye may teach, there it is, that ye may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord hath spoken unto them by the hand of Moses. So God did not want these priests to be tainted by alcohol, to have their minds, you know, numbed, with, with, you know, with these substances. He wanted them to know the difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, so they could be effective teachers to the people of Israel. So they would be able to teach the statutes of the Lord. You know, that, that it wasn't just Moses that taught them. These priests were required to teach Israel as well. And so when you're preaching a sermon, 
it's one thing to say, you know, we believe in, what's a good doctrine? We, we believe in, in the, the post-trip, pre-rap doctrine, you know, rapture. This is why we believe it. These are the verses. Great. You've taught which is holy. You've taught that which is clean. But then you also have to differentiate and show people what is unclean, what is wrong. The reason we don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture is because these verses obviously contradict. These do not, this, that this position does not go in line with these passages in the Bible. You have to teach both these things. Not just that which is clean, but also that which is unclean. Okay? Uh, very, very important. I, I think I can personally improve in this as I was going through this myself. It's important. Yes, uh, that's the truth. Yes, but our children are one day going to grow up and they're going to hear from other preachers, actually, you were told that was right, but actually this is right. Let me show you why. But if you've not prepared your kids, you've not prepared the church to be able to understand and see the errors of what is unholy, what is unclean, then uh, you know, they're not going to be able to differentiate those things. And so as teachers, we're tasked to make sure, you know, to, 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 to you know, expand your knowledge a little bit. You know, understand why people hold different positions and why you don't hold that position and, why, and how you can debunk that using the Word of God. Okay? So teach what is right and wrong. That was point number five, uh, four. Point number four. Point number five is teach by example. Teach by example. And uh, if you guys can go to Matthew 5.19, Matthew 5.19, if you, while you're turning to Matthew 5.19, I'm going to read to you from Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10 says, For Ezra had prepared his heart, pay attention now, prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. We see how Ezra prepared to be a teacher. The first thing he did was he seeked or sought the law of the Lord, right? He went to the scriptures and said, I'm going to seek what it teaches. And then as he saw, okay, this is what the Bible says. The next thing he did, uh, uh, um, uh, seek the law of the Lord and to do it. He said, okay, I see this. I have to uh, be more like the Bible. I need to be what God says I need to be, right? And he started to make change in his life. You know, he wasn't e empty, vain preaching. He made sure that he was trying to live out what he was seeing in the Word of God. And then, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments, okay? So you've got to be that example. You've got to be that example. It's such a bad thing when, when preachers are hypocrites. And, uh, you know, we're all hypocrites to some measure because no one's perfect, right? And, and we're, we're commanded to teach the whole counsel of God. Of course, I'm not going to skip things even if I'm struggling in that area. Otherwise, I'll be avoiding certain passages of the Bible. But we see how we ought to teach. We ought to teach by example. When you get up here to teach, make sure this is something that you're doing well at, that, you, you know, you, you're, you're having success and you're being productive at. And, and that will make you more effective as a teacher because the congregation sees, oh, yeah, well, you know, I can see brother so-and-so is preaching there. Yeah, you know, he's put this to practice. I've seen some examples in his life. Yeah, I can see how this is true. It's true to him, and when it's true to you, it's going to be more true to them. It's kind of like when you go soul winning, and you have the confidence, you have the zeal. You're like, sure, you know, the Bible tells us he can be 100% sure. I know I'm 100% sure. When people see that confidence, they see that, that belief in you, they see that effectiveness in you, they're more likely to hear and accept what you have to say. Right? But when you're more timid and things like that, you know, you're unsure, you're shy, they're going to, you don't even believe what you're trying to say. Right? So it's important to teach by example. Look at Matthew 5.19. Matthew 5.19, uh, words of Jesus Christ, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Man, how bad is that? Now, this is all about saved people because these are people in the kingdom of heaven, right? So preachers can break commandments, right, and, and, and commit sin, and to make me feel better, teach you to do the same sins, all right? Ah, it makes me feel better. If, if everyone does it, it doesn't, it doesn't look like such a bad thing. But I'll be caught, if I do that, the least in the kingdom of heaven. We'd rather be the next bit part that says that, but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven, okay? And I think all of our desire is to be great in the kingdom of heaven, right? To do as much as we can for the Lord, to take up those higher positions as much as possible. Well, we have to do and teach them. 
teach the commandments of, of Jesus Christ. So uh, teach by example. Of course, Jesus Christ was one who taught by example. So that was point number five, teach by example. Point number six is teach with preparation. Teach with preparation. It kind of does uh, overlap a little bit with what I mentioned before. But teach with preparation, um, I'll just read to you 2 Timothy 2.15, you know this one. It says, study, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman, right? What's study? Working, you know, you're, 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 you're working, you're studying the word of God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, when you have the opportunity to get up here, Make sure you study. Make sure you become a worker, a workman, all right? And you put the effort in. You get as much as you can from the Word of God because you're about to preach it to the children of God. You're about to preach it to those that are going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years and beyond. You know, uh, you're preaching to very important people. Make sure you study. Teach with preparation, please. Like I said, you know, yes, I have those opportunities, those random, you know, unplanned one hour sermon preparation time but that's not my goal I'm, I'm not trying to just find an hour i'm not trying to find just half an hour to, to preach a sermon most of my sermons before once i sit down and start putting things on paper no less than four hours maybe somewhere between five to seven hours i spend putting a sermon together okay and it's not just what I put on paper. Obviously, throughout the week, I've been thinking about it. I've been meditating about it, you know. And, and I, I don't know how many hours. I mean, if you really put all the hours together, I don't know how long I spend uh, putting sermons together. And I trust you're doing the same. And I, I know you are. I know you are. Because you're spending a lot of time in the Word of God rather than going, you know, just uh, waffling on about nonsense. And you can tell when someone hasn't prepared, they're just waffling on. Or they're going back to their pet doctrines. Or they're just going back to salvation. Right? They're just going to, to the very uh, things that are, that are milk, the things that they're very aware, common, uh, aware of, but they're not get, really getting deep into the Word of God. They're not really preparing. And so I wanted to give you some tips of preparation. If you're someone that says, look, I just don't know how to prepare a sermon. You know, I, I want to prepare more. I want to study more. How do I do that? Well, I'll, I'll give you some tips, things that I've learned, and, and these are things that I learned in primary school. Okay? I was taught in primary school, when you put an essay together, when you're putting a presentation together, an assignment together, you, 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 you start with the five W's. Do you know what I'm talking about? The five W's? I don't know if you learned this stuff in school. The five W's are this. Who, what, when, where, why. And some will add how, because how's got a W at the end of how. Right? But, or, or the six W's or whatever. But these are the five W's. Who, what, when, where, why. This is going to help you. I don't know if you, you, you probably don't even realize this, but I do this a lot in my sermons. Now, I don't, I don't start, I don't, I'm not like, all right, who? You know, and what? You know, second point. It's not like that. It's, it's all sort of filtered throughout, throughout the, the message, okay? But generally, I'll give you an example of this. I, again, I don't want you to just to state the truth. I want you to teach the truth, okay? You need to be teachers. So if I, you know, if I come behind the point, and I, I want to I encourage you in the King James Bible, the King James Bible, the preserved word of God, and I come here and I say, well, you know, uh, you know, I believe the King James Bible is perfect, pure, without error, you know, and it's the word of God in the English, you know, in the English language. This church will say, amen, right? I mean, we all agree with that. <clears throat> but you haven't really taught anybody anything, right? You're, you're, you're stating a truth, and you haven't really taught why you hold that position. Why is it? We want to know. I want to know. Okay, and uh, so this is where the five W's really help. You know, so let me give you some ideas here. It's who? So the first thing would be, okay, I want to really reinforce King James Bible, really encourage everyone here. Who? First one might be, who were the translators? All right, you might want to go about how educated they were. They knew all these languages, all these kind of stuff, right? Who were the translators? Next one, who commissioned the work into English? Well, that was King James, right? And, and he saw a necessity for the Bible to be in the, in the hands of the common man, blah, blah, blah. Next one, who promised to preserve the Bible? Well, that's God, right? Psalm 12. You know, God promised to preserve the Bible. Who? Who can publish or make copies of the King James Bible? So who? anybody can. It's not copyrighted. Praise God, unlike the, the modern versions. And so you can see how who 
can lead you to many questions and, 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 and well, I can teach these things. These are things that probably a lot of people haven't thought about or now I'm teaching why I believe this book is perfect, right? What? What? What are the differences with the other versions? Now you can show errors in the other versions and show how the King James Bible has it right. What manuscripts and other resources were used to translate? Okay, it wasn't just the Greek and the Hebrew text. They used previous works that were, were done. You can show the, 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 the work and, and the, um, the purification process, if you want, um, of the English language, <coughs> or the English Bible. What, what is the English standard? Well, everyone knows the English standard is the King James Bible. All the modern translations always point back to the King James Bible and compare themselves to the King James. What? What is the best-selling Bible of all time? Well, it's the King James Bible. That sounds like the Word of God if it's the best-seller of all time, right? Uh, when? When? When was it translated? You know, 1611. You know, God's been using this Bible for over 400 years. Praise God for the work. You know, when? When was the English language at its peak? You can say, hey, those days the English, English language was much more rich, was at its peak. You know, and the King James Bible had an, has, ha, has had a, a part in, in def, uh, 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 molding what the English language is today. Okay? So you can, there's so many things. And then where? Where? You know, where were the translators from? Where are the errors in the corrupt Bibles? You know, where can I find a copy of the King James Bible? Why? Why is the King James Bible used to translate uh, into other languages? Why do other versions contain errors? Why are the other versions copyrighted? You know, why is it important to have a perfect, preserved Word of God? And so now, you're breaking up those W's, and look, you're not going to... Uh, you know, this is something I would do, but I'm not going to answer every question. Otherwise, this would be like a five-part series on the King James Bible or something, right? But you take what you think is most... Uh, you think the church is going to benefit most from. You might even look at the things that you might not fully uh, have grasped. You might, not, you might be lacking a bit of knowledge. So just to educate yourself, you'll cover some of those questions. And then when you preach about the King James Bible, it's not just I believe it. Well, that's great. Praise God. But now you can really tell people, you can teach people why you believe it and why they should believe it as well. Okay? So you're really reinforcing people. You're really nailing down doctrines. And that's what a teacher does. Okay, nails down the things uh, that need to be learnt. All right, so that point number six was, um, <clears throat> what was point number six? Teach with preparation, you know, prepare. And so I'll just go over those six points so far. Number one was to teach the Word of God. Number two is teach in the power of God. Three, teach your family. Four, teach what is right and wrong. Five, teach by example. Six, teach with preparation. Prepare yourselves, right? Number seven, Teach how to battle, right? Teach how to battle. Psalm 18.34 says, He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in mine arms. That's pretty strong, right? That he can break steel in his arms. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to read to you from, from, if you guys can go to uh, 1 Timothy 6, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Judges 3 verse 1 says, now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many as of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Look at this. Only that the generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before, knew nothing thereof. You know, God wants us to know how to war. God wants to, know, wants to teach us how to fight battles, how to be a good soldier. You know, and this is why he's given us the word of God. It's the sword of the spirit, the sword. He wants us to go to battle. And so teach how to battle. And this goes back to the idea of, um, you know, uh, teaching the difference between right and wrong. Okay. So when people have false doctrine, you want to also spend time teaching people how to fight the false doctrine, how to fight it using the word of God. You know, it's not just... Well, I feel the Bible says this, and they feel the Bible says that, okay? No, no, no. I mean, if it's a total heresy, you know, if it's a total heresy, you've got to be able to show people why that's dangerous, right? And, and why the Word of God is so contrary to those teachings. That's important. You're going to battle. You're fighting for the faith, right? You're, you're standing for the Word of God. And 1 Timothy 6.12, look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.12, says, fight the good fight of faith. 
lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and has, has professed a good profession before many witnesses. You know, we're called to fight a good fight of faith. This book is what gives us faith, the Word of God, right? Hearing the Word of God gives us faith. So we need to take this Bible and go to war with it, all right? We need to defeat our enemies or deliver our brethren from the clutches of the devil, right? They might be falling to false doctrine. We want to be able to show them, deliver them from the false teaching. In saying that, we have to be balancing a lot of things, right? Because do I know every verse? I mean, if you say, Pastor Kevin, can you show me X verse there? Am I going to be able to like just, oh yeah, that means this. Now sometimes I might because I've looked into that. I'm not going to know. I don't know every part of the Bible. And one thing I've learned is my mind can only take so much. Sometimes I learn things and then I, I haven't visited those things for a long time. I'm learning some other things. And I go back and I've actually forgotten or I need to be refreshed my memory of those things that I've learned before. Also, there are verses in the Bible that are just more cryptic, right? They're, they're challenging. But obviously, these things are not going to affect the major doctrines. They're not going to affect the foundational truths that we have as Christians, okay? So, you know, I, I think there's, there's, there's a time where we can say, well, you know, that verse is quite cryptic. These might be the interpretations of that. So long as those interpretations do not undo the strong foundations of faith that you've already established, right? The, 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 the statement of faith, the, the foundational doctrines, uh, so we need to be prepared, you know, to, to teach to war, how to battle, teach our children how to fight the good uh, fight of faith. And um, the next point that I have, point number eight, is to teach all things. Teach all things. And this is what I love about, um, you know, w what people commonly term the new IFB movement. In all honesty, I, I love... I love the general IFB churches. The, the most, I, I love many of the pastors I've met. I've met. I love many of the preachers. I've learned a lot of good things. But in hindsight, I also didn't learn things that I should have learned. There are a lot of passages, a lot of verses that just weren't being taught to me. And because they're not being taught, I'm ill-prepared in life. I'm ill-prepared to uh, you know, uh, stand strong on certain things. And, and when you're not being taught the entire Word of God, you're going to waver to and fro with every wind of doctrine, potentially. Okay, potentially. And so, yes, there's a lot of good churches, a lot of teaching, a lot of good things, but they're not teaching all things, right? They're not teaching all things. Jesus Christ, you guys go to Acts 20, please. Acts 20, Jesus Christ says in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And it says this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. All things, Jesus Christ says, right? And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is the Great Commission. This is what we've been left to do. Yes, we win souls. Praise God. If you're not getting out there preaching the gospel, you're not uh, winning souls, you're not doing the Great Commission. And if you're not baptizing, you're not doing the Great Commission either. And, and that's what a lot of people think of. They think of winning souls and baptism. Praise God, that's important. That's super important, right? But that's not the end of the Great Commission. You haven't fulfilled the Great Commission if you're not doing all of it, right? And it says, once again there, teaching them, those that you got saved, those that you got baptized, where you're going to teach them, that's where church fits in, right? You get church in here, people in here, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And this is where churches really drop the ball. In fact, they're dropping the ball all over the place in the Great Commission, okay? We need to make sure we're a church that is not afraid to teach whatever chapter of the Bible we're up to, whatever topic we're up to. We, we can't be that way. I can't be that way as a pastor, or I'm, not, I'm letting you guys down. I'm not fulfilling the Great Commission. If I'm like, Lord, you've laid this on my heart here. I see this here that I need to preach, but that's a bit controversial, Lord. I think I might skip that one this time. No, I, I'm being a disservice to you, and I'm, being, uh, I'm not honoring the great commission that God has given us. You guys are in Acts 20. Look at verse 26. Acts 20, 26. Paul uh, says here, Wherefore I take you to rec uh, record this day that I am pure from, all the, from the blood of all men. Why is he pure from the blood of all men? For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And Paul says, look, in order for me to just have a clear conscience, 
my hands free from blood. You know, uh, if you destroy yourself, so be it, but I'm clean from it because I've been able to declare the, all the counsel of God to you. You know, I, I didn't avoid anything. You know, I taught you all these things. Verse number 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. What do we feed the church of God? Again, all the counsel of God. If I'm not giving you all the counsel, I'm not feeding you properly. Okay, I'm not doing the task that God has assigned pastors, teachers, leaders to do in their churches. And this is why I, I love uh, the chapter by chapter. Okay? Because all of us, I don't care what you say, all of us have our pet doctrines that we love the most, that we're more, more passionate about. And you'll see that. Like when you get new people preaching, they're often, you know, probably the first two, three, four sermons are very, all very similar, right? Because there's something that's on their heart, they, they, they love it, nothing wrong with that. You know, they just have their pet doctrines. But you have to break out of those shackles as well. There's a lot of the Bible to cover, right? And uh, that's why I love going chapter by chapter because I'm forced to cover things that otherwise I would totally avoid. And maybe not even on purpose. It's just something that's not on my mind. And by, by going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, I'm, I'm forced to teach something, to think and study. And, and I don't always know the answer, but I'll do the best I can to give you a reasonable answer. Right? I'll do the best I can to give you a good interpretation of what is being taught there. And so it's important that we, we teach all things. Again, we've gone through Genesis recently. You know, we're still going through the book of Genesis. How bad would it be if I just skipped over Genesis 19? Right? How bad would that be? Uh, guys, I think you can read that in your own time. We'll jump straight to Genesis 20. You know, that would be a, a failure of a pastor, a failure of a, of a preacher. And uh, yeah, so remember, it's part of the Great Commission, not just soul winning, baptizing believers, but teaching them all things. This is why it's important for churches to to uh, you know, have multiple services a week. You're not going to cover everything in the Bible if you're having just one service a week. Now, if that's all you can do, that's all you can do. You know? But the goal is to build on those things, to build, have extra opportunities of preaching and teaching. And uh, you know, God will help you then be able to cover the entire Bible. And look, at the end, of, I'm never going to cover the entire Bible. It's, it's never going to happen. I can live 500 years old, and I'll still have things that I need to cover. Okay, we might cover every chapter, every, every book, but if I went through that book again, I bet you my preaching would be different. I'll be able to take different applications of that for different things. It's a never-ending Bible, right? We'll just, we just keep going. Uh, I'm sure for all eternity in heaven, we're just going to keep reading this Bible. Jesus will gather us around. We'll learn new things all the time. I'm actually looking forward to that opportunity to know more about His Word. All right. The next one here, and we kind of spoke about this a little bit in our session before, point number nine is... Teach with compassion. Teach with compassion. And please go to Mark 6. I want to see, show you this about Jesus Christ. Mark 6, 34. And we're talking about how, how this is part of his personality that he had here. Mark 6, 34. It says, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. That's Jesus, the God of the universe. You know, where, is, where should we just dust to him, right? But when he sees the people, he's moved with compassion. He says it's because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things, many things. And when I look at this quality of Christ, I'm really thankful that when I see sheep without a shepherd, I'm moved with compassion. I'm moved with compassion. And uh, sometimes we can be critical of sheep with no shepherd. But they're just sheep, all right? They, they need a shepherd. Maybe they've had shepherds, and the shepherds were just not good shepherds, right? Maybe the shepherd has failed them, and it's easy to sort of look at the sheep and go, well, why are you without a shepherd? We need to be moved with compassion for people, you know? And, uh, you know, this is why the Sydney church even exists. You know, I've seen those guys leave my previous church and uh, not sure what to do, different churches, losing their zeal for soul winning, I didn't want to go back to Sydney. <laughs> I love it up here. I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to go back there. But you know, I did it because I saw the multitudes. I saw the, I saw the families. And I can't, I, I'm sorry, but I was moved by compassion for them. You know? But that's what Jesus did. So I know that's a good quality to have, right? And so my, the point that I have here, guys, is that we should teach with compassion. We need to develop a love and care for the brethren. So when I get here to preach, this is not the Kevin Sepulveda show, right? I'm not here to just, oh, guys, look at me, give me your attention. I come here preaching thinking, 
What does brother Jason need to hear this morning? You know, what does brother Callum, what does Timothy need to hear? What does Nicholas, what does Isabel, you know, what does Lily need to, to hear? You know, what does my church, what does my church need? You know, Lord, and of course, I mean, everything in the Bible they need, right? But I, I'm thinking about the church and I'm thinking, I, I want to make sure these guys can, can gain knowledge, that they can mature, that they, they know what they need to do in life, that, 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 you know, they're not just doing things on the outward to, to impress people, but the, the changes are ha- happening in the inward, man. Right? That they're walking in a new man and then they can understand why the outward is important once they have the new man. They'll never understand the outward if they're just walking, the, you know, living after the flesh. It's never going to happen. And so, you know, I, I think of the church and I want you guys, when you get up here, is please have a love, compassion for the brethren. When you prepare a sermon, go, Lord, I love my brethren. Please show me what I need to teach them so they can grow in the Lord. You know, you got to have compassion. And that's where the emotions come in. That's when you see that people really mean what they say is when, when you can see that the emotion they have behind them, again, you can emulate these things for so long until you realize it's fake, right? But at some point, you know, these, you know this preacher there, that teacher, whoever it is, not necessarily me, other people get here, you know, they love, that person loves me. He's put the work in, he's, he's thought about what we need to hear, and he's put the effort in, and I can see that he has a love for the, for the congregation. That's the teacher you need to be, someone that's moved by love and compassion. And... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Luke, Luke 11, verse 1. You can turn there if you want. Luke 11, verse 1. It says, And it came to pass that as he was praying, that's Jesus, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Did Jesus say, well, I'm not teaching you that? Verse number 2. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. One thing I, I realize as a pastor, and I have made these, these uh, I have told you guys this before, and maybe I should mention it more often, but if there's something you want me to preach, if, you want, if there's something you want me to teach, come and tell me. In fact, there are sermons that I've, te- I've taught that someone has come up to me and said, oh, do you mind covering this topic? I'm, I'm not that clear on that or whatever. That's happened, Right? And so I've gone, you know, I, I've changed my, my, my schedule and I've taught that because someone in my church needed it. Now, if you're not comfortable doing that, use the offering box, just put a note in there, Pastor Kevin, do you mind covering whatever topic? And I, might, I probably won't do it next week, all right? But at some point, that'll be on, the, on my mind and I'll be seeking the Lord for answers. It might be something that I don't fully understand, that I don't fully grasp. And so I would seek the Lord. And so I see this with Jesus, right? He had compassion for the disciple that asked him, can you teach me how to pray? He goes, yeah, I'll do it. I'll teach you how to pray. You know? And that's how we need to be, as pastors, we do need to be a little bit flexible. Okay? And here, what the congregation, that's, that's being moved by compassion. You have a love for the brethren, right? It's not just what can I show. You know? it's, it's what do the brethren need. That's point number nine, teach with compassion. I'm up to my last point. Last point here is teach deep things. Teach deep things. And again, this will come with experience, okay? You're not going to be teaching the deepest things when you're doing your first sermon, you know, even your first 10 sermons. You know, the deeper things will come as you, as you start, you know, uh, preaching more and more. And please go, to, um, please go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to show you this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. Please turn there. Teach deep things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. While you turn there, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 5.12 which says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Milk is important, but so is meat. Okay, And as we grow as a church, as I grow as a pastor, as you grow in the Lord, the milk needs to start developing into you know, cereal, and then the cereal into potatoes and rice, and then that needs to be turned into meat. And when we get to the meat, we're getting really deep into the Word of God. You know, we're, we're having a greater knowledge, great awareness of how the, the depths of, of the Word of God, the great wisdoms that we can pull out of this, you know, it, it's like mining for gold or something, right? It takes a lot of work just to find that little nugget of gold. That's what it's like with the Bible. You know, you can get things on the surface, but you get great truths when you dig in deep, right? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, let's read this carefully. It says, But God have, re- have revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, look at this, yea, 
the deep things of God, right? The only person that can get deep into the Bible is the one that has the Holy Spirit of God in them. And look, you can resist, you can quench the Holy Ghost to some extent, you know, in your life. You can grieve the Holy Ghost. So it's important that you, you make yourself available to God to help you when you prepare because it's the Spirit of God, not you. You're not going to get the deep things. It's the Spirit of God in you that's going to reveal the deep things of God. Verse number 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, say the Spirit of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received, praise God for this, right? We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Not only are they deep things, they're free. God wants us to know those things, right? He's not charging us anything, right? He's not saying, well, send me $50, whatever. You send me, you know, $50 every week for a semester and I'll teach you Bible college. They're free things. The deep things of God should be free. God's given it to us for free. I should then offer these things to you for free without charging you, right? This is why Bible college is ungodly, but that's another topic. Verse number 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, This is how we get deep. We compare spiritual with spiritual. The Bible is, is a spiritual book. You compare scripture with scripture. You have lived a spiritual life as a saved person. You compare scripture with with your personal experiences. You say, I know this is true because five years ago when I was doing this, God revealed this to me in the Word and I did it and it followed through. God's Word was true in my life. That's comparing spiritual things with spiritual things, okay? Already I started off by saying, you know, it's not about the poems. It's not about the quotes of great men of God and, or, you know, past pastors or, you know, the hymns and stuff like that. Look, I'm not against any of those things, strangely. I don't know if you know that or not, okay? I'm not against, as I preach something, I might pull something out or just quote a, a hymn that we're all familiar with that illustrates the same truth. I'm not against a poem that has great truths and great wisdom, pulling that out once in a while. I'm not against repeating something a pastor had said which has great truths. You know, I've, I've said many times in my sermons, you know, my old pastor used to say, you know, a great church will, uh, you know, you can only have a great church if it's made up of great families. That's the truth, praise God. But it came from a, the wisdom of a man, right? I'm, I'm not against these things. But unfortunately, in our independent fundamental Baptist churches, these guys that have gone through college, they've been taught how to be a cookie cutter preacher. They all, every sermon is like this. Every sermon has the stories of old preachers, you know, preachers of old. Every sermon has some poem. Every sermon has them going back to the Greek and the Hebrew, right? Every sermon has them telling stories of, of people that you don't even know if they're saved or not, right? From the 1700s, 18... Again, I'm not against those things, right? In of themselves, once in a while, if you're, you know, supplementing something you've taught from the Word of God with some, some truth like that, good, praise God. I don't want you to never feel like, feel like I can never do that. Just make sure that's not... The, the, the emphasis of your sermon, right? That's not, you know, you're not wasting time. I feel like some, so many times these pastors, oh man, I've got to preach for 20 minutes. When am I going to preach for 20 minutes? Well, if I give them a story, that'll be five minutes. If, if, I, if I quote a poem right at the end, that'll be another five minutes. You know, then I don't need to really preach for 10 minutes or something, right? No, that's not, that's not how we should be. We should be preachers, teachers that get into the deep things of God, be connected to the Holy Spirit. You need to appreciate when you hear preachers and pastors get really deep and pull out truths. You know that person studied. You know that person loves me. He wants, to, he wants to pull these. You know that person's been communicating with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been teaching them these things. And you need to take heed when they're very deep things. The Bible says in Isaiah 28, 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precepts must be upon precepts. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. You know, when you teach the Bible, you need to go line upon line. The Bible's many times like a puzzle, and you need to just show people how you put that puzzle together. Okay, show people how to do those things. I'm, I'm trying to think of a doctrine right now. Um, what would be a good doctrine? Uh, 
let's just go back to the rapture, just an easy one, right? The, the doctrine of the rapture, we have stuff in the book of Revelation. We have stuff in the Gospels. We have stuff in the Old Testament. We have stuff in 1 Corinthians and, and 1 Thessalonians. I mean, the rapture, the second coming of Christ is found throughout many passages, right? And a lot of people struggle to understand eschatology. Your job as a teacher, when you teach on these things, is to get all those puzzle pieces together and you know they're going to fit somehow. They're going to fit because it's the Word of God. It's, it's consistent. It's always right. If you don't understand, that's your problem. Like, you need to learn what it is. You know those puzzle pieces are going to fit. Again, it's one thing to say, we believe in a post tree pre raph rapture. You get plenty of amens. It's another thing to take those puzzle pieces, comparing spiritual with spiritual, putting them together. Now you're getting really, really deep. You know, you're getting deep. You're showing people. You've put the effort in. You're showing people the Holy Ghost is helping you, working with you to, to do these things. And I love, I love it when I hear you guys preach and you guys take this passage there and you go, well, you know, it's like this passage over here. And then you can pull out certain truths like this. Now, there's, there's a few ways to do this. And, and, and I know, I know, this takes time. This takes time, right? You start with the milk. You start working your way to the meat. This takes time. But I want to give you an example. I want to I show you how you can accomplish this. Okay, let's go to the book of Romans. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. This should be the starting point because as you piece these puzzles together, you're always going to piece them correctly. It's always right. Uh, Jesus Christ makes it, or, or God makes it very easy for us many times. And the book of Romans is a great example of this. Go to Romans chapter 1 verse 17. This is where you start as a preacher. If you're not used to comparing spiritual to spiritual, you're not used to comparing scripture to scripture. This is where you start, okay? Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. God's done all the work for you already. All you have to do is go, God, where was it written? And then you find out it's Habakkuk 2.4. And then as you're teaching this, you go back to Habakkuk 2.4, and you pull out greater truths. That, hey, you're putting the puzzle together. God's already put the puzzle together for you. But you're comparing spiritual with spiritual. Look at Romans 2.24. 2, Romans 2.24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. Thank you, God. Another puzzle piece put together. Where is it written? Isaiah 52.5. Romans 3.4 now. Romans 3.4. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, thou shalt mightest be uh, justified by thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Where was it written? Psalm 51.4. Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. We quote that all the time, Saul Winnie. Well, not all the time, but a lot of the time, right? There is none righteous, no, not one. As it is written. Where was it written, God? Psalm 14.3. Romans 4.17. Romans 4.17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Now, you guys should know where that is. Which book, at least? Genesis, right? I've made father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead, and called those things which uh, be not as though they were. Genesis 17.5. Romans 8, now. Romans 8.36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. God, where's it written? Psalm 44.22. This is where you start, guys. As, as newer teachers, newer preachers, this is what you do. Don't, don't get hung up with you being, you know, trying to be overly smart. You know, you need to line upon line, right? Precept upon precept. Build these things. Use the tools that God has already given us, okay? Romans 9.13, as it is written, Romans 9.13, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. God, where? Malachi 1, 2, and 3, that's where he wrote it. Romans 9.33, Romans 9.33, as it is written, behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, and rock of offense, and whosoever believe on him shall not be ashamed. Where God? Isaiah 28, 16. Go to Romans 10, 15. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of, feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And this is the best to dismantle dispensationalism because it's in Isaiah 52, 7. It's in the Old Testament when God quoted how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. You know what that means? That means in the time of Isaiah, there were people preaching the gospel of peace. Praise God, right? And you can see God's already connecting these dots for us. Romans 11.8, Romans 11.8, according as it is written, God have given them the spirit of slumber 
eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day, Isaiah 29.10. Romans 11.26, And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That's Isaiah 59.20. Look at Romans 14 now, Romans 14.11. For as sorry, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. I think that's also in Philippians. Anyway, it's in Isaiah 49, 18. Isaiah 49, 18. Romans 15, 3. Romans 15, 3. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that are reproached. Thee fell on me. That's Psalm 69 9. And then Romans 15 9. Romans 15 9. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. That's Psalm 18 49. And the last one I've got here in Romans, Romans 15 21. But as it is written, To whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. That's Isaiah 52, 15. So you can see God wants us to go deep. He wants us to compare spiritual with spiritual. He's given us so many clues in the Bible. All right? And, you know, again, pay attention to when the, when the Bible says, you know, that these are foreshadowings of Christ and compares Christ to things in the Old Testament. God's just connecting the dots all over for us. Right? And then when you become familiar with this, you become comfortable, you get used to it, then you can really go in and see and find things for yourself that are not so plainly stated, comparing spiritual with spiritual, comparing your own experiences. I don't care about Spurgeon or, or other... I, I care about you, preacher. I care about the guy that stands behind his pulpit and says, I experienced this from the Word of God. I know this is true because this happened to me. I want to know your story. I want to know about your soul winning efforts because I know you're a saved brother in the Lord. I'd rather know about your stories than some guy I don't even know if he's that saved. And Spurgeon wasn't saved, by the way. But, you know, other, other names that people bring up. Let me go through those 10 points once again. Apt to teach. How do we develop our teaching skills? Number one, teach the Word of God. Number two, teach in the power of God. Number three, teach your family. Number four, teach what is right and wrong. Number five, teach by example. Number six, teach with preparation. Number seven, teach how to battle. Number eight, teach all things. Number nine, teach with compassion. And number 10, teach deep things. All right, I'll leave it there. Let's pray.